MSU until very recently, actually. We found out through somebody coming in Tucson. And then we got this pamphlet, and we were kind of exhilarated to see it because it's a breath of fresh air in the student movement. It goes way beyond the level of optics that we're accustomed to, the SDS and various other student groups. And we're very encouraged by the firmness with which you take on evolution and politics. And we look forward to helping in any way we can your efforts. Uh, I just wanted to begin that way. And also just to say that I'll say a few remarks about the book Low Wage Capitalism and a few remarks about the capitalist crisis that began in 2007. And maybe a few remarks about revolutionary politics and perspective. And then I hope we can have a discussion I don't know what your time constraints are. Uh, can can they kick you out? We can, good moderate closes officially at midnight. Oh. Hopefully, <laughs> 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 don't say that. Okay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a little time. So let me just say that the book, Low Wage Capitalism, was written with the purpose in mind of trying to get the post-Soviet period of world capitalism into perspective. And for, not just for some academic reason, but in order to try to see what has happened in the last three decades that has changed the capitalist world and how it's affecting the working class in the United States as well as all around the world. But in as much as we're here and we're responsible for developing the revolutionary movement, the working class movement, the movement of the oppressed in this country, we're particularly interested in the way world capitalism has developed and what it means for that struggle, which I think we're all dedicated to carrying out. So, the book really begins around the opening up of China to capitalist development. We don't think China is a capitalist country. We think there's a, a core of socialist institutions. The planning principle is still very much operative in China in spite of the intrusion of capitalism. But the opening up of this vast low-wage country to capitalist development. Then the collapse of the USSR and Eastern Europe. And the opening up of the US, the former USSR and all of the republics and all of the Eastern European countries to capitalism. And the opening up of India, which took place simultaneously around 1991, once the USSR collapsed, the IMF moved into and broke open a lot of the restrictions that the Indian bourgeoisie had uh, on the imperialist investment. And then the, the uh, rendering vulnerable all those countries that had relied on the USSR as a material force, as a balance against the intrusion of imperialism, were now subject to neoliberalism, openly aggressive neoliberalism. What did this do? It expanded the world working, for, work, working class, available for imperialist exploitation, from one and a half billion people to three billion people within two decades all in low-wage countries. Nothing like this has ever happened in history. Such a dramatic transformation. Simultaneously with this political development and economic development, 
there was a scientific technological revolution in progress. You're familiar with some of the components of it. Satellite communications, computers, very powerful software, super tankers, jumbo jets, computerized ports. Uh, you can just go down the list. And these technological innovations, all of which were aimed at intensifying the exploitation of labor, allowed the transnational monopolies to expand their super exploitation into every corner of the globe. To break up the productive process into segments, to farm it out wherever they can find the cheapest labor any place in the world. And to use those super profits to strengthen their stranglehold on the world. And, and garner greater profits. They also, by the way, encouraged a wave of immigration into the United States, which is also a way of bringing low-wage labor here while they're trying to get it abroad. And the total effect was to create a global competition among workers of all nationalities on all continents against each other. And that's where we stand at the beginning of the 21st century in terms of the restructuring of global capitalism. The word globalization is a benign word which has no content to it of a class nature and discloses nothing as to what it really is. In my book, whenever I refer to it, I call it imperialist globalization. I never just leave it without an adjective that helps to clarify what it is. Now, this is a, a tremendous, for those of you who studied Lenin and his book, Imperials, I don't know if you've studied it, but I'll just tell you, if you haven't, one of the main theses of Lenin's book on Imperials is to show how the super exploitation of the colonies led to super profits that were brought into the imperialist heartland and used to create an upper stratum in the labor movement and conservatize the workers and have a privileged stratum of workers, trade union officials, sitting on top of the labor movement and keeping the workers from rebelling and fostering these privileges among the upper layers of the workers. And he goes, he goes into it, he shows how it's in England. He quotes Cecil Rhodes saying, if you, if, you don't want a, if you don't want civil war in England, you have to become an imperialist. You have to go and get loot abroad, bring it home, and give some crumbs to the workers over here, or else they will rebel and have our hearts. Now, that was the case for the hundred years since imperialism really took root when they conquered Samoa and Hawaii and the Philippines and Cuba and Puerto Rico and the U.S. The British divided and the French divided up Africa. So, up until the 70s, in the 1970s and 80s. That was the case. But, and, and during that era of the period, the colonial people worked in the mines, they worked on plantations to produce cash crops for the metropolis. Or they worked on infrastructure, railroads, roads, docks, ports, 
to bring the, the wealth out of the colonial areas. Rubber in the Congo, copper in Malaya, whatever. Every kind of gold, diamonds in South Africa. I mean, that's, that's what super exploitation of the colonial working class was. With the, and, and that was the basis of the privileges of the upper layer of the working class in the various countries. With the advent of technology, everything changed. Once, once the Soviet Union collapsed, and the U.S. and the imperialists had free hand and Because with the new technology, they didn't have to go and find a mine or, or an agricultural region or just cut down trees to exploit and super exploit workers in the colonial countries. Any place they could find workers, they could exploit them by opening up a factory, by, by opening up a call center, by opening up any kind of facility because they now had the communications, the fiber optic cable, the, net, the, the, the communication satellites, software, work, what they call workflow software, to exploit the workers wherever they work. So all geographical limitations of exploitation of workers were removed. They can go to Vietnam, they can go to Thailand, they can go any place and set up a chip factory, they can set up an auto factory, they can set up a garment factory, they can set up a Walmart, they can set up whatever. Because it's all linked together to the, to the big capitalists by technology. Let me, I want to read, so I don't read a lot from the book, but I want to read one thing that gives it a sort of an illustration. Everybody, I don't know, but many of you may have heard of Thomas Friedman. He's an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. You know, he's a millionaire. His wife is a millionaire independently of him. He's enamored of technology. He's a Zionist of the first order. But he was enraptured by this technology, which he thought was the wave of the future. He had everybody tied together. And he wrote a book called The World is Flat. And before he sat down to write the book, he went to Michael Dell, because he travels in Mill Circle. Michael Dell owns Dell Computer. And he said to Michael Dell, I'm asking you now, I'm about to write a book using your computer. Can you tell me how my computer was produced? Now, I don't know if Michael Dell was the one who told him this, or he got one of his functionaries to tell us to free him. But here's what he, here's what he, uh, he wrote. He said once his order was placed to Dell, you know, when you pull him up and you your computer, it went either to Penang, Malaysia, one of the six Dell factories in the world. The others are on Limerick Island, Xianmen, China, El Dorado, Del Sol, Brazil, Nashville, Tennessee, and Austin, Texas. Surrounding every Dell factory are numerous supports, part supply centers called supplies supplier logistics centers, owned by different suppliers, not by Dell. They are like staging areas. If you're a Dell supplier anywhere in the world, your job is to keep the, your SCLC full of the specific parts so they can constantly be chucked over to the Dell factory for just-in-time manufacturing. Dell Malaysia sends an email every two hours to its supply center telling it what parts it wants in the next 90 minutes. Trucks from these supply centers pull up. A barcode on each part is recorded. The parts are loaded into bins for assembly. It wasn't possible to tell precisely where this computer was made, but these are the choices. The Intel processor came from an Intel factory located either in the Philippines, Costa Rica, Malaysia, or China. The memory came from the locally owned factories in South Korea, Taiwan, Germany, and Japan. 
The graphics card could have come from a Taiwanese owned factory in China, the motherboard from a Korea owned factory in Shanghai, the hard disk from a Japanese owned factory in Indonesia or Malaysia, and so on. And every day, a Dell 747 takes off from a, from a uh, Indonesia with 25,000 kilos on it. Comes over here, or wherever it goes. Goes to Austin, or wherever, and UPS picks it up and it comes to your door. That's just a microcosmic example of the way the Imperials have reorganized the world economic system to their advantage. So somebody here who may be in a <coughs> factory in Austin, Texas, and uh, their, their supply center is supplying other boys or whatever, the workers who are doing it in Austin, Texas, are competing with workers in Ireland, in China, in Brazil, in the Philippines. It's a global competition of workers. And Marx explained in the Communist Manifesto that the competition among workers is what keeps capitalism afloat. It's in there. You, you look at it. It's in the book, actually. And so this. This imperialist globalization is like an invisible force. It, it acts where the workers can't see it. The capitalists can see what's going on. They have a, an overview. There's a software made by a German company, and Oracle makes similar software called uh, Workflow Software. The Germans make one called the cockpit. What does it mean? You sit in a big one, the executives from a global corporation, the managers, and one wall is filled with computer screens that where they can watch any factory, any place in their empire, all over the world, in real time. And another wall has data on it about production. <coughs> that's going on. And another wall has their finances as it changes from minute to minute based upon how much they're, they're spending as the production process is going on and what they're projecting. And they, and they sit there and they, they manipulate the managing of all their, their entire empire. Now, some of this is so, you know, it's not some of them see everything, there's subdivisions, there's some, some parts and some, there's some other parts. But the capitalists have the overview. The workers have no overview. They're in the factories, they're in the Walmarts, they're in the malls, they're in the hospitals, they're in the law offices or the call centers, and they don't know, have no control over or any knowledge of what the bosses are doing to them. Globally. But what has happened is, since technology, this new technological revolution, and the collapse of the USSR, and the expansion of the low-wage workforce, workers in the imperialist countries compete job for job with workers in the low-wage countries. It used to be the only ones who were affected by the Labor in the colonial countries were agricultural workers or mine workers. Now, all workers are affected by that competition. It's very important for us to grasp this because this is the dominant feature of capitalism today, of global capitalism. And that's why I call it low wage capitalism because that's a phase we're in. And all you have to do is pick up any newspaper, any day of the week, and they'll verify it for you that wages are going down, that the, that, that the standard of living is going down. It's been going down since the 1970s, the late 1970s. Wages have been dropped. A little blip in the end of the 90s, but basically it went down. But not only that, it weakens the labor movement. It has unbelievably weakened the labor movement. 
give you the example of the Stanley Tool Company in Bridgeport, New York. Then it makes more tool. You see, you have screwdrivers, hammers, planes, chisels. Any construction factory, any carpentry place, you'll see Stanley Tools. It's a global company. And their headquarters is in Bridgeport, and it has been for decades. They moved much of their operation to Thailand and other places, but they kept the factory in Richport, the pilot factory. And there's a union. Every day, the management has a big blackboard and they put the production quotas on the blackboard for Thailand, for the Thailand factory. And they have threatened the workers, if you don't match this, we're going to move this to Thailand. And of course, they speeded them up, and the union couldn't do anything about it, or could have, but didn't do anything about it. There were other instances, but there was testimony before Congress, where a company will be in negotiations with the union on, on the premises, and they'll pull five trucks up outside the building where the negotiations are going. And he'll be on the truck to Mexico. This is, this is congressional testimony. I'm not making this up. As a way of pressuring the, labor, the negotiations for concessions. This is a phenomenon that's rampant. So you get the idea. What is, why, why bring it up? Why even study? It's because it has profound implications for the struggle of the open place in the United States. I want to just quickly switch to the capitalist crisis because that has intensified everything that has been done, that has been created by this low wage capitalism. Because massive unemployment has intensified the competition among workers for jobs in the United States. This, there may be, according to some experts, Economic Policy Institute, which is a uh, liberal think tank, there's five workers looking for every job available. It's probably them. Because they don't know the workers who are poor, who are just trying to get by in the neighborhood. But let's take their word at it. There's five workers looking for every job in the United States right now. That alone drives down wages, just by that. And that intensifies the general low wage st structure of capitalism. And this crisis is not going away. It's receded from the headlines lately because the capitalists have had a recovery. It's not a big recovery. It's an anemic, puny recovery. Their profits have recovered. The bank's profits have recovered. The oil company's profits have recovered tremendously. Some of the auto factories and auto companies, after having decimated the working class, lowered wages from $28 an hour to $14 an hour, taken benefits, taken health care, taken pensions away, reduced them. They have with the help of the Obama administration, closed, laid off about 200,000 workers and closed down dozens of things. So on that basis of shrinking their industry, have, have bloated their profits back up. But the workers haven't recovered. And not only haven't they recovered, their crisis is deepening. The crisis is deepening. After having if the, well, what the capitalist class did, and I, I've written on this, and I characterize the situation now as a capitalist impasse, an impasse of capitalism. An impasse is when you kick both off, you come to a point where you, you can't move forward. They can't get out of this crisis. They put the U.S., not the, not the global capital. A global capitalist put in $14 trillion, the government said, to put it to bail out 
the capital system. That's according to the Bank of London. In the United States, they put in about $10.5 trillion in bailouts, loan guarantees, buying up toxic mortgages, and so on. To suspend the downward spiral that was beginning to take on momentum in 2008. They suspended it. They have stopped it temporarily. It's different from the crash of the 30s, where they didn't have any knowledge. It was the first time it happened to them. And they didn't know how to deal with it. the financiers and the government and the boss. They just they had no way of, of even conceptualizing what was going on when the world economy just collapsed in you know, the production. The stock market crashed in 29, in 1931, bank failures began, and then there's, then you went down to you went down to 25 to 30% of the in the United States, and people were all out on the streets selling out what's living in the cities and so on. They didn't have any mechanism to interfere with the but Bernanke, he did the head of the Federal Reserve Board, and his group are students of the profession. That's how they, they wrote their thesis on That's what he wrote his thesis on. And they mobilized money to stop this thing from going down. And what has happened is that they temporarily stabilized the collapse stabilized the system from, and kept it from collapsing and allowed some form of anemic growth. But that can't last because they, still, they suffer from capitalist overproduction and they can't get out of it. They cannot grow their way out of it as an economic system. And I think this generation of revolutionary students Revolutionaries and workers are in a very, very special position because you are living in a period that is the beginning for a world historic socioeconomic system has reached an impasse and is going to move in the direction of dragging all of humanity down and opening up huge revolutionary opportunities for those who did. Don't lose faith. If I was your age, I'd be looking forward to this and getting ready because there's no way you're going to get it. The irony is, it's all developed by the productivity of labor. The productivity of labor is what is underneath us. All of capitalism for 500 years has developed productivity because the development of productivity is better, intensified exploitation. More, less workers produce more in less time, faster and faster. That's the whole historic trend. It's been that way since they first had went out, took workers out of their cottages, weaving textiles and put them in the big building. Brought them together and brought them into the wool and yarn and, 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 and the room or the textile and so put the wool in one place. That was a form of increasing the productivity of them. And from then on it led to industrial revolution and now to the technological revolution and the digital revolution. <coughs> All to get rid of workers. So to get rid of workers and make those who are still work, work faster. So they could get more profits out of it. Profit is all that they know. Nothing happens in the society without a profit. We wouldn't have a hat on, we wouldn't have a this table, we wouldn't have a bomb in 747, we wouldn't have that computer. If some Boston mega profit from it and exploit some workers to get this produced. Profit system runs, begins with money to make profits. That's what it's about. It's about nothing else. 
Anything that's not profit oriented is something that has been won by the workers over historical periods of struggle, like Social Security, like Medicare, like welfare, like unemployment insurance, like disability insurance. Nobody gave it to us. We took it. We demanded it. We fought for it. We died for it. In the 30s, in the 60s, black people died for the poverty program and so on. Everything we have, we fought that has to do with profit, that, that, that pushes the profit on the side and, and, and relieves the excesses of capital for us. But all the rest of it, all production, all the services, whether, whether you're changing a bedpan or not, teaching a child in school, or, or whatever, or that's a special case to teach. Or, or you will want to stack the shelves, or you or you create, making an enemy money, or an uh, assembly line. Everything is so that they can get the unpaid labor, so that they can give you your wages and go home and, and just have your pittance and get what you, you just stay alive, Raise your family so your kids can come to be exploited. That's all. It's, that's what wages are. And while they can they get wealth from generation to generation, these dynasties grow and grow through and grow through and grow through. And we and our ancestors and their ancestors, we all live on the margins. We just bother them. We never get it. We never get it much of the wealth. And that's how this whole system works. So they do this technology and makes this more efficient for them. What does it do to the dynamic of capitalism? If, they, if their factories and their facilities create more and more food, faster and faster, fewer and fewer workers, that means production develops rapidly and more rapidly. And consumption drags behind. And now it goes down because this mess on the floor. It can't last. It can't go on. This thing has to collapse. Because the market, they're destroying their own markets. With it. They're not trying to export the dynamics prices, they're not going to make them. The more powerful the productive forces are going to be, the harder it is for them to start up their system. And the only way workers work and are able to stay alive under capitalism is they sell their labor to some boss. But if the boss can't make a profit, they won't buy your labor, and the thing begins to go down. And that's where we're at. The capitalist economy has come back up a couple of percentage points. But it's still 25 to 30 million more than They can't absorb it. Their, 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 their machine is too productive. They would have to grow at a tempestuous rate to begin to absorb a fraction of the workers who are now generating more. People who are on part time work who, who can't afford to be on part time, they need a full time job. I know people in this room who are temporary workers, just in time workers. They've created a just in time workforce. You know, just in time production, a Toyota invented, where you don't have a big inventory, you just have these supply centers send you the parts you need when you need it on time and you don't have to have a big inventory. And if, you, if the orders go down, you don't get stuck with a whole lot. Well, now they have just-in-time workers. The temporary workers are, are an enemy, a huge percentage of the workers in this country. So you just, you just go, uh, and you go to a temporary agency, and, uh, and they send you out. And because so and so needs so many workers, and then they hire you, and then when they don't need you anymore, goodbye. 
This is the way those systems run. And they can't grow out of the social system. That's the way they're going to in these places. And the military doesn't do that. It used to be that the military, like in World War II and afterwards, Korean War, the Vietnam War, where you had big mobilizations, many tanks and many huge numbers of planes and huge numbers of munitions and guns and supplies. And and it was a big economic enterprise war. And that helped them a great deal to, to grow in the whole post-World War II period. It's not my like thing. They got strong bombs. These guys bombs. Saddam guys bombs. Battlefield robots. Predator drones that are running from thousands of miles away. They have a high-tech military. You can generate jobs on the basis of some smart bombs and a few robots. The way they did, when they turned the world factories into the create tanks and so on and so forth. You can't put millions of workers into the world. The military option, while it's necessary to keep the capital system in the can can't change the situation. So they're at an impasse right now, and it's based upon the tension of dollars that they play, and also by the fact that I think buying hundreds of billions of dollars of treasury bills, putting money into the economy for quacks. It's called QB2, it's not very easy. That's a fancy word for the putting, they print the money and put it in. It's not money that the Federal Reserve has. They're just buying the treasury bills. Not with money they have. When they buy it, they just create a common in their books. It says, okay, we got this money. But they don't have it. It's, it there's no value up behind it. There's no value behind it. All this money's going into the economy. But it doesn't represent wealth that's been created by wealth. It's just, it's paid for fictitious capital. And they're just pumping the system. That means everything for us and revolution. What I said before about the decimation of the labor aristocracy is going on the pace. The way we live in this country has been a great break on the people, on the world. But the foundation of State capital by workers for three years, which hasn't happened since the 1930s sit-down strikes. I don't want to compare it to the 30s, it's just a little opening and a little beginning, but it's a rupture. Because they wanted to break the union of the teachers. The teachers used to have a decent wage, teachers used to have job security, teachers used to have a good pension, teachers used to have two months over. They had fairly, uh, because of the strength of the teachers' unions. Not because they were very good. But as part of the austerity program, because the forces had to put all this $10 trillion dollars out there, they want to get it back. They want to get it back. From which class are they going to take? Us, our class. And that's what the austerity program is about. It's part of the general economic crisis. They spent $10 trillion to stop this thing from collapsing. And who holds this money? Who holds the money that's borrowed from the government? That the government gets? It's bondholders. The, the, the deficit, the debt is $13 trillion. $2 trillion is in China. And the other $11 trillion is held by Rich bondholders all around the world, especially in the United States. 
and they want their money. They want their interest on their money. And all the governments, the, the, the cities, the states, the municipalities, and the federal government have all this money that they borrowed from, and these bondholders who are holding the debt, they want it back. They want their interest payments. They want their principal. And they're going to make the teachers pay for it. The public workers pay for it. That's, and that's part of the economic crisis. It's part of the impasse. They can't generate surplus value from workers to pay off this debt. I'll, I'll just give you a final example. In, at, during World War II and after World War II, the debt incurred by the Roosevelt and then Truman administration to wage World War II was far greater than the present deficit. It was 125% of the gross national product. That means it was huge. But they paid it off. They paid it off within five years. You know why? Because they expanded around the world, they plundered the workers, and they got profits. They set factories in motion. They, they auto industry expanded, the housing industry expanded, the appliance industry expanded. They, were, they had markets that they could sell their goods in all around the world and in the United States. And with the, with the surplus value, with the value created by the workers, the treasuries filled up with revenue, with tax revenue, and so on. They wiped out a huge deficit. They can't wipe this out because they haven't got the market to sell the goods, to bring the revenue in, into the treasury. So their solution is to attack the workers and take them. And in the process, destroy the education system, destroy the infrastructure, destroy social services. So not only to attack the workers who are working in these services, but to, to attack the workers who receive the service. The students, the youth, whose teachers are being thrown out. There's a reason for that. They don't need to educate so many workers anymore because they have all these automated processes. They destroyed so many skills, they put so many skills into the machine, and into software. And when the young, this generation goes out, to get a job, you may have a great education, but they haven't got the job because of your education. You might have a degree in sociology and you end up in Barnes and Noble. You may have a degree in, uh, in uh, administration and you end up um, in more. So the system, this world is style capital system. This crash that began in 2007 is a, a big turning point. Nobody should underestimate it. And so it has no revolutionary significance. The world is right now taking it on the chin. Seem like this is a retreat, except for Wisconsin, and there's some revived union solidarity going on in the country. That's something new, and it's a breath of fresh air. And the teachers are, by the way, in the background. They're defining their own union leadership in many places because they've been so heavily attacked. But the whole process. Marxism looks at things in the development. Actually, Marxism is the doctrine of development. It sees everything in motion. It sees the motion. It goes beyond taking a snapshot at the moment. Because if you took a snapshot right now, and you listen to me what I was thinking, I was crazy, maybe something. 
based on a snapshot of where things are. Nothing that I say really seems to correspond to what the way the world is. I'm painting a picture of a huge crisis, and they're being, and the working class is being besieged by this crisis. If they don't seem conscious of it, character, of its scope, of its duration, of its intensity, they seem to be in many ways internalizing the problem of thinking each one thinking it's their own fault, or it's just inevitable it can't be resisted. But Marxism says being social and economic being ultimately determines consciousness. But there's a great lag between the, the human mind is a conservative way. It takes it takes events and time for the consciousness of the workers to catch up with the actual developments around them. And that are impending on them. And nobody knows when this is going to happen or how it's going to happen. It happened a little bit in Wisconsin. Workers went from making concessions and the need to kill it. That propelled them into motion, drastic, dramatic motion. Quantity turned into quality. Concession, concession, concession. No union. It's a difference. Once there's no union, you work at the world of the They were faced with the union busting for a war government. They were faced with the loss of the union, which is different from the loss of the position. Because if you have your union, you can fight back against you. But if they take your union, they've taken away your organization and your ability to fight back. And you have to start from scratch. So it begins a little bit of this concept. I don't want to overdo it. We have to see the world not as they have been for the past 30 years, and not as they are at this particular moment, but as they are what they will become under new conditions in which life cannot go on in the old way, the way it happened in the 19th If we believe in Marxist theory, Economics. And we believe in the theme of crisis, which is what Marx explained and explained how and why. Then we must, from that follows, the fact that the conditions of the workers are going to deteriorate and are going to drive them in a more militant direction as a matter of survival. And we have to be prepared and be always probing for what struggles are can be picking out, for how we can push the envelope. We have to be as a we are a revolutionary Marxist party. Others are in different parties. But we should all be thinking that we need a revolutionary sees the working class as the agent of change. The only class that can bring this thing down, nothing else can do it. It's the only class that can stop a war, by the way. You just think of all the wars that have happened in the last hundred years and think of how they ended. How did they end? They either ended in the victory of one imperialist or another, or the workers stopping the war and overthrowing the system, the way the Chinese did in World War II by defeating the Japanese 
and then going on to make a revolution. They stopped the whole invasion. Then the Bolsheviks stopped World War I when the German workers deserted, rebelled, and marched into Berlin, and the French Navy mutiny, and the Bolsheviks overturned the government of Russia. That's how the wars were stopped, by the workers. And that's how this whole thing is going to be changed. Only by the workers and the oppressed people. I don't want to just think it's just workers alone. It's all the oppressed people, black, Latin, Asian, native, lesbian, gay, women, people who are disabled, immigrant workers, undocumented workers. I, I mean the working class in the most broad sense. The broad sense. And that is our mission. And we need to help them because they're going to need a lot of Help. They will rebel. This is without question. They will rebel. But the question is how can we make that rebellion successful and be consummate in the destruction of this exploitative monster that, that's ready to take the planet down with it? That's, that's what we all have to cope with. And that's what Lenin is all about. We are Leninists, and we will not get anybody on the basis of Lenin and his theory of state and revolution and his theory of the Bank of Party. And uh, we hope that to be right with you all. So that's it for me. state, a very reactionary state, and to, to hear and see what we've seen here. Uh, gay people have this thing called gay dar. Well, I want to take that further and say red dar. <laughs> and feel that, and we, I really feel that we have met comrades here. And when you put on your working class Marxist lens and you meet comrades, there is nothing, nothing that, that is more wonderful in the world than to meet a comrade. You know, there's nothing like your family, of course, but when you meet a comrade in the struggle that shares your worldview and that you know has your back and is joined together, there's nothing like it. And that's the way it's been feeling here in Utah the last two nights. So we're very happy to be here, you know, just like hearing, you know, the, the brother who was organizing, trying to organize at a call center, your work in the immigration work, you know. I mean, I haven't been studying the last few years, and you guys put me to shame. But the way you quote, the things you're reading, it's like incredible. And this sort of thing is extremely important because, as Fred said, the the our class is in a crisis. We're preparing for an upsurge, and the experience of the things that you're talking about here in Utah are extremely important. And our goal, of course, is to eventually bring a revolutionary struggle, or help to bring, along with the workers and the oppressed here in this country, we want to bring down U.S. imperialism. And we are very involved in organizing solidarity, solidarity here at home and solidarity abroad, you know, for Cuba, for Venezuela, for countries in Africa, for the Philippines, etc. And we have always said that the greatest act of solidarity that we can give to people struggling abroad is to bring the revolutionary struggle here to this country. And we're, we look forward to that. So I want to talk a little bit about the immigration struggle as an example of how important it is to get deep into a struggle in order to uh, have the necessary experiences to build that kind of struggle and kind of movement that we're talking about, but also because it helps share in learning the conditions that we face right now, where we have this very long-range goal of building for socialism, and we want to hit the streets and call you know, for the workers to take over the means of production. But if we did that, you know, maybe two people would follow us, and that you know, is not necessarily going to bring 
revolution, I'll put you in jail or something like that, or more likely people will think you're crazy. So we want to, to adapt to the conditions in order to build a movement, in order to, lar to organize large demonstrations, large mobilizations, and of course to raise consciousness. And so I want to talk a little bit about the immigration struggle from that point of view. Uh, it's very interesting to know that uh, Comrade Lenin actually predicted and, sp and wrote a lot about how imperialism would evolve this way, as you know, Fred uh, has mentioned. And one of the things that he wrote about and predicted about was how workers from third world countries would be forced to migrate to the more developed imperialist countries. And uh, migration to Europe or to the U.S. is nothing new. And in fact, you know, immigrants have, evolved, have migrated into the United States forever. And they've always been treated as a, an expendable uh, workforce, sometimes welcome, sometimes brought here under guest worker programs with super exploitive conditions. And, often, and when the economy goes bad, then they're treated the way they're treated right now. And uh, this is not a phenomena that's unique to the United States, as you know. This is happening around the world, in Europe. Uh, many similar programs like Arizona legislation, like uh, the sense of renter legislation earlier, are also being copycatted in Europe and other developed countries. But one of the most important things about this million of people of workforce that is moving around the world, and not just economic migrants, but of course we know that there are millions of workers that are being forced to migrate as a result of the climate crisis. Every time there's a tsunami, every time there's an earthquake, workers are forced to flee their homes. And these are also uh, migrants, and climate migrants. And in both this and those that are forced to leave because of economic situations back home, you know, you have an, an army in the making, an army that understands very well, you know, the capitalist, uh, a system and is very angry and uh, sooner or later this workforce is going to you know be really angry and we certainly saw that here in 2006 when migrants exploded uh, into the arena in the United States uh, and really were victorious in stopping the sense of veteran legislation and were able to have at least momentarily uh, a victory and unfortunately um, it wasn't enough and, and uh, very vicious anti-immigrant legislation, of course, has been happening around the country. And this is not just an attack on workers. This is also very much part of racism in this country. And it's a racist attack as well. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important to hear what uh, the sisters and brothers in this city are doing and in this state. Because racism has been a tool that imperialism has used forever as a way to divide and conquer the working class. And it's very important for us to get uh, the issue of racism and get it right. Uh, I was so happy to hear the sister that was announcing about how you're going to have a class on studying uh, the role of women in building a revolutionary movement and the importance of that. And it reminded me of two phrases that I think are very important to, to grasp on the issue of racism and the issue of sexism. And that's that uh, on the issue of racism, there's a formulation that I love to repeat, and that's that uh, class is primary, but racism is not secondary. I think that speaks a lot to how much the struggle for workers' liberation is so much entwined with the struggle against racism. And two, in the women's movement in the past, we have said that you cannot have women's liberation without a revolution, but you can't have a revolution without women's liberation. And it's very much intertwined, right? And you can't separate it. And the, the, the goal to grasp women's oppression like that, of grasping the special oppression of workers of color, is very key for revolutionaries in this country and abroad, and so it's very important for us to get that. Um, I want to, uh, I'm actually not going to talk very long because I'm really exhausted, but I wanted to say a little bit about um, the, the announcement about Carlos Montes 
and what happened with the Freedom Road members is extremely important. Uh, I worked a little bit with Carlos and the immigrant struggle a couple years ago and I spent some time in LA. And this SWAT light attack is not just an attack on uh, activists in this country, it's not just an attack on the left, uh, it's also attack, an attack in the, against the immigrant rights movement in California, which is one of the most important places where the immigrant rights struggle has uh, occurred. And it's very important for activists, you know, our party gives as much as we can to the struggle to stop the attacks on these activists. And we have an event Saturday, as a matter of fact, in New York City. And this new attack against Carlos has to be answered. And it has to be answered seriously. And we all have to take this, and I'm sure that you do, take this very seriously because it's an attack against every single one of us in this room. And it is what the state is preparing as they see the possibility of an upsurge in this country. Uh, they know, they see the writing on the wall, and they know that what is about to happen here is a, a revolutionary upsurge. And it's preparing these kinds of attacks in order to, to put a chill and a damper on the movement. And it's important that that hasn't happened, that there has been a lot of activity to support Rizzo. And, you know, they're not in our party, but it's one of those examples of how important it is for the left to unite. And if you have differences here and there, uh, at a time like this, they're uh, completely irrelevant. And what's important is for us to gather, and they're, you know, Frizzo is definitely one of the few organizations among the left where you actually can't have a, a working relationship, which is pathetic. And, you know, there's a few, you know, left parties that you can do that. Um, so I think I want to end with this. Um, I, I do, you know, want to also say that uh, immigrants come here with a lot of class consciousness and the experiences that uh, Latino immigrants in particular have uh, are going to be extremely important in the period of head, ahead. They're coming with the experiences of understanding that what is happening in Venezuela is important not just for the workers and the people of Venezuela, but they're important for not all of the Americas and they're important for all the world struggle. And we know that the people of the Middle East, the people in the Philippines, the people in Africa, many of them look to the struggle in Latin America uh, because of the, the revolutionary upheavals that are happening there. Because of the fact that Bolivia uh, elected the first indigenous president of that country in a state, in a country that should have had a president from indigenous background a long time ago. And we look to the fact that Cuba, despite having uh, 50 years of war and economic sanctions by the most powerful country in the world, has survived. It is very difficult for Cuba. Uh, the economic crisis that is hitting the world, Cuba is not immune from that. Uh, it is struggling to build socialism. It can't build socialism right now. It's just barely able to defend the little they've been able to build in 50 years of war, but it still remains a beacon uh, of anti-imperialist uh, fight, and it still is an attempt to build socialism 90 miles from U.S. imperialism, and this is no small victory. Uh, so we look forward to working with you. We look forward to, to continuing communications. We don't want to come here and leave and never see you or never talk to you again. Because the movement in the United States counts on us to coordinate our work, to build our unity, to build our solid, uh, solidarity. Uh, Fred said that we are living in an economic period that no one else has ever lived in in this country. And that merits and, and demands that we stretch ourselves and, and get prepared for a new period. And we look forward uh, to working with you in the period ahead. So, thank you. Now, for this, it's a lecture's choice. Would you like to do a QA or one of the Yeah, if you can please. If you just open it up to the floor, whatever. Um, I guess, Fred, this question will be for you. With your analysis of capitalism and imperialism at its current stage, it seems to me like you're emphasizing material production. 
uh, as to where Lenin was always for on financial capital. So for me, at least, the big crises that I see that are going to happen is going to be with student debt. Um, you have more and more students, as you mentioned, right, are getting these worthless degrees, and at the same time, they're not going to be able to pay back loans. It's essentially reproducing what happened with the mortgage crisis, where you uh, give mortgages to families who can't afford them, that capital stops coming in. Which sort of segues into the, the broader point, right? We're not living in the era of just the nefarious industrious capital. It's all about the working class essentially footing the bill for everything. They use tax dollars, they send it to the public sector for things like education, things like military, and then it gets sold out to private contractors. You're there everywhere. So I guess with that, with those sort of um, things in mind, how would you maybe say how your analysis reflects that? Well spoken. I could have said it better than you. But I appreciate also bringing in the question of debt, the student debt especially, into, into the discussion. It's a material factor in the development. It's going to be a material factor in the development of the strength. What's happening now is the students are beginning to reject college, not go to college. Students who would have gone to college five years ago are not going. Because you know what? They say it's not worth it. They see what's happening. They see that they're going to and they're going to graduate with an average of twenty or thirty thousand dollars in debt, and that they're going to be indentured servants for the rest of their life. And if they can't get married, they can't buy a house. They can't, they can't do anything. They're 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 indebted to the banks, and that I mean I think what I was underneath this when you contrast the financial side to the production side was the the the, the, the financial. Uh, 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 domination of society by the financiers is a gigantic factor in, 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 in changing and driving down the material conditions of the world. And I, like I said before, now you take the Wisconsin thing. Uh, I wrote an article, I don't know where, where, where it is, but you know, this became a famous uh, phone conversation that was recorded by between Governor Walker and David Koch, mm -hmm. this giant oil industrialist. But he's also not just oil, he's all over. He's got all kinds of industrial stuff. He's the, the most wealthy uh, uh, private individual, uh, uh, private uh, man of Wall Street uh, company in the world. And he's got 40 something billion dollars. And he was talking to Walker on the phone. And Walker said, oh, well, I think we should maybe use some provocateurs to, to break up this kind of, you know, where they were sitting in. And uh, they, they were having a nice little discussion. And somebody recorded and put it on YouTube. But it wasn't just they all the municipal bondholders and state bondholders in the United States were for work because he was trying to find a way to make the working class pay the debt. And it was in so the, the fact that Democrats and Republican governors across the board, Democrats in, in, in Massachusetts, in California, Jerry Brown. People, and then there are Republican moderates who are not even ideological, who are just talking crazy. The guy today, Lee Franklin, this demonstration today, he wants to declare Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid unconstitutional. Well, it seems like madness. But you know what? The, the impulse comes from the financiers. They want the money. They want that money, and Wall Street wants that money. One of the things behind the destruction of the education system and charter schools and the privatization of the schools is the money that the bankers see in every big city budget all over the country. There's a famous uh, educator. He wrote, death at an early age, 
Jonathan Kozel. Has anybody ever heard of Jonathan Kozel? If you have, he, he's, he's from Boston. He studied the educational system. He showed how it was driving. It's more segregated now than it was during segregation. He showed how the poor, and the, uh, mainly African American and Latino students were being just marginalized. And he wrote an article in 2007 about the child school. And he called it the big enchilada. The big enchilada. The hedge funds and the private equity firms suddenly realized they were running out of resources, places to steal. And they realized the next frontier. Every big city, Cleveland, Detroit, uh, New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, those budgets for education are huge. Hundreds of millions of dollars. If they can find it, could find a way. We get their hooks into that. So all of a sudden, we have to hear charter schools, schools, charter schools, charter schools. And that works had Jeffrey Cambridge on, and, and the Asian woman from DC, I can't remember her name, the, the board. And they were, and they had, and they still do. They have special programs on education. And the Obama administration created the Race to the Top, the Race to the Top, $4 billion pot for all the, for all the boards of education uh, that can prove that they are going to teach to the to standard testing, that they're going to use performance-based evaluation of teachers, meaning cost of the union, that they're going to have this X number of charter schools, and if, you, and if they gang it all up, then they can apply to Washington and get some of that $4 billion. But in the meantime, they're, cre they're creating charter schools. What do the charter schools do? Hedge funds buy charter schools, private equity funds, by charter schools, they get paid from the from the education budget of the municipality. They give them money to run these schools. In New York City, in Harlem, a hedge fund is going to get like a big amount of money from the Bloomberg administration uh, to to set up a charter school in Harlem. And this is going on all throughout. It's going on in Michigan and Detroit. It's going on. It's plundered by the financiers of the educational system. Can you, can you because there's money in it. They, they, they can't take money and invest in the new auto factories. You can't sell the automobiles. I, I meant to, I left this out of my presentation. And this is, goes a little bit to your point. When the financial collapse took place in 2007, 2008, really, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and the whole thing started to tumble down and the children started to pour into the economy, the whole other economy. When the smoke cleared, what was underneath? The housing market, this housing bubble, there were 8 million houses on the market. And there was only about 6.2 million customers for the houses. They had overproduced almost 2 million houses that couldn't be sold. The auto industry, which when 2007 and 2006 and 2005 was producing 19 million cars a year, between 17 and 19 million cars a year. Suddenly could only sell 10 million cars. They had overproduced. In order, and each corporation in the struggle for profits and market share had built up all these factories and, and they couldn't sell the cars because it's capitalism. They only sell for a profit. They wouldn't give a car to somebody at a bargain price. It's some rural person whose their car broke down. They lose their job, whatever, because your car breaks down. You can't afford to get it fixed. There's millions of, I, I'm not advocating the automobile as the primary mode of transportation. I thoroughly believe in mass transportation. 
but that's a separate issue. There's millions of people in this country who need cars. They, won't get them. they can't get the distribution of these automobiles because it has to be sold at a profit. The rational thing is, you got 17 million cars, make them available at an affordable price, maybe below cost. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you have to sell it uh, below cost. You give it below cost. That's what a rational system would do if it, if it was concerned with people. You lose your car, and you're in a place where there's no mass transportation. You lose your job. That's the way it goes. But this is the profit system. So they had 17 million cars, and they could only sell 10 million at a time. Now they're struggling in the recovery to get it up to 11 or 12 million. But what did they do? They shrank their industry. That's what the, when the Obama administration went in and saved the auto companies with whatever it was, $80, $80 billion, I don't remember how much they got. He financed the destruction of auto plants and the laying off of 200,000 workers. When a capitalist system has to shrink its production base, it means that it's in a deep, deep crisis. And the housing market has not recovered. They're not building new houses. The orders for new construction are down. What are the two engines of the U.S. capitalist economy? Besides entertainment and air aircraft. Housing and automobiles. That's the core of the economy. You shrink the housing industry. You shrink the lumber industry. You shrink the plaster industry, you shrink the fabric industry, the electronics and the electrical supply industry, carpeting, landscaping, insulation, everything that goes into a house. You, 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 you shrink the oil industry, you shrink the parts industry. You shrink the rubber industry, you shrink the glass industry, the paint industry, you shrink the, the, the aluminum industry, the plastic industry. The, the system is not able to grow. It can't sustain itself. They had to destroy productive forces in the crisis in order to start up again. And, but they started up at a lower level, meaning less workers are being employed, both in housing and in auto, and in auto parts, and everything that, that goes on. So it was a financial crisis. The banks, you know, it was the banks that started to fail. But underneath was, was the, the, the capitalist overproduction, which is underneath the whole crisis. Why the banks now? No. Private industries have two trillion dollars or one point eight trillion dollars in cash. They're sitting on the cash. They have no place to put. They can't invest it in productive investment. They use it for speculation on the currency markets and so on. It's because capitalism must grow, but it can't grow. It's at an impasse right now. And the only road that you can see forward is down. Because they, 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 they can't grow. So, and capitalist overproduction is underneath it. And if you read Marx, that's what he explains. That's what. And Lenin wrote it best. He says consumption expands, production expands geometrically, consumption expands at a snail's pace. And now it's worse than a snail's pace, it's contracted. Um, this is Ty, the one again. Um, considering that what the biotech industry is beginning to grow rather rapidly, is it? Worthwhile, do you think, to 
are there ways to combat that? Is it worthwhile to like, in some way, um, start educating people on these industries that are rapidly expanding? I mean, Monsanto, all sorts oh, of oh, biotech oh, industry oh, is like, it looks crazy. They are infamous around the world. They create seeds that don't need that only can plant once. They destroy themselves they plant once. And they go in to a country, or all in this country. And, and they um, they force farmers to buy the seed that grows, they make a contract with the farm to grow X amount of corn. But you gotta use our seeds. We buy your corn. But those seeds, you have to buy them every year, over and over again. Because they destroy themselves. It's, it, 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 it's disrupting the natural cycle of agriculture. And they have detectives. They have detectives who roam the fields and spy on farmers to see if they're using one central seed uh, illegally. That they, they got them somehow, they, they got them not from Monsanto. Maybe they, they got other corn, not Monsanto, other corn, and they're using the seeds from natural corn to grow because they're violating the country. I mean, it's, it's out there. And that's, I don't know much about it, but that much I know about Monsanto. They go to the third world countries or the first countries, and they force these genetically modified seeds on, on peasants, or, you know, farmers in India or wherever. And, and they get them on the program. They have to buy these seeds. Well, it's more than just, um, I guess, like a financial obligation also. The seeds are what they call Roundup resistant, so they force them into using um, not only the seeds, but also it comes along with everything else, um, pesticides in order to right. make the seeds grow. And, right. Otherwise, the crops won't grow. Yes, thank you. I so. forgot that. Monsanto makes pesticides, not just seed. And you have, so you have to grow their corn. With their seed, it is their pesticide. It's a chemical company. It's Which? Not, it was never an agricultural company. Right. It was a chemical company. Which I guess then my question goes to how do we combat that sort of thing? I mean, again, the industry is is growing so rapidly. In some way, I feel like, as a movement, there must be something that we can do, I don't know, in some way to, I guess, just inform people, maybe. But as these, as this industry is rising, I mean, for example, I was reading something about um, engineers like creating meat in labs. And that sort of thing is obviously incredibly dangerous for any cow farmer. I mean regardless of how the industry is. Anyway, awful. I mean, it would still destroy all of these other people and their jobs. Um, as a movement, at what point do we say, like, we have an opportunity now, as it is growing, to do something about it? I mean, one thing about the, the environmental movement in the United States, unfortunately, most of it has been very much within the confines of not be an apologist for capitalism rather than really taking on a revolutionary class perspective. And if there's any any issue that merits, you know, a revolutionary class perspective, it's only this one. And unfortunately, many of the people who are following this issue uh, look at it very individually and rather push that you, you know, grow a garden in a neighborhood, which is all good. I mean, communists can't be opposed to that. But that's not going to change fundamentally the, the problem, right? And I know that the, last year I had a chance to go to Bolivia for the climate uh, change, climate justice conference.
here, you know, in India and, and Bolivia and other places around the third world, they have much more of a revolutionary understanding of this question. And the people who came from the United States were, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, when, when the leaders of, of, of uh, Bolivia talked about how only socialism would deal with the question of the environment and the climate justice, most of the U.S. delegation was shocked and was like, well, we can't go back home and talk about capitalism, much less socialism. And there was many of us who were arguing, well, if we don't, you know, we're screwed, you know. So, you know, it's just one of the, the most, and you've never seen a major demonstration in Washington on this issue, and it's certainly one issue that merits that. And uh, and I and I also think that the left has also, you know, been behind the curve in in in, in entering this issue. You know, we've got to we've got to give a class debate to this issue, and I think we've been behind the curve on this as well because there's been other issues that have been much more important. And it wasn't until Copenhagen, for example, that uh, more of the left in the in the United States paid more attention to this crisis when there was, you know, rebellions and so forth and so on. But it is, to me, the one of the top issues that cries out for a socialist perspective. Because when the, the effects of the climate crisis have more of a, an impact, only socialists and only a socialist government and a socialist perspective is going to be able to organize society in the appropriate way. You know, if, you know, we look at the worst case scenario and New York begins to go underwater, you know, a capitalist government, you know, worst case scenario, right? A capitalist government is not going to be able to, it will, will not have the political will to organize a major city like that to protect the population. Only a socialist government will do that, right? And so, you know, young people, I, I can't imagine how young people cannot make this, you know, one of the top priorities in our movement. Um, you know, the revolutionaries have to intervene on this question. So educating people, mobilizing people, organizing around this issue is very important, very important. Um, what's your party, what, what part is your party planning to take in the 2012 election as revolutionaries? Should it be relevant to us? Is it worth our time to even uh, take part in the 2012 election, or should we focus on other issues and through different channels? Our party hasn't taken a position yet on whether we're going to run candidates or not. We'll probably we have an important meeting in the in the early fall where we'll, we'll probably make a decision. Uh, my own opinion, you know, without having a party wide discussion, is that I think it's important for us to run candidates next year. Uh, our party has ran candidates on occasion, not because we want to win, you know, we don't want to inherit a capitalist government, but because elections in this country are always a giant vacuum that just suck out, you know, the movement. And uh, it's important for us to enter the election so that we can provide an answer to that. You know, everyone, all the media, all the attention is on this. We didn't run candidates in, in 08. Really? Yeah, um, because that was when Obama, you know, was running, and not because we supported Obama at all. Uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, important to take a minute to talk about that because I think we all remember what the country was like here in the United States before Obama was elected, and how electrified, uh, not class conscious elements, uh, but young people, many young people. And certainly many in the black community and other oppressed communities were very excited about the prospect of having the first African American president. And it was, it, it quickly became an issue against racism, right? And we, uh, the party officially endorsed Cynthia McKinney, who was running with the Green Party. Because Cynthia was a, a very important activist and uh, it was an important time to support her. But when um, the Palin phenomena happened, it, the Obama campaign quickly became an issue of a, the fight against racism. And so we did not attack or criticize Obama at all because we wanted to stand with the black community. 
so it was very important. You know, it was very important. It was a defeat against racism. Uh, and the country was like, you know, it was just like a very interesting place to be that year, right? Uh, but that honeymoon didn't last long at all. And Obama, as we predicted, uh, as the left, quickly became uh, obvious to all that he was an instrument of imperialism and that he was the perfect candidate for the imperialists at the time. And that's why the major elements of the ruling class supported him. Many people at the time thought that uh, um, Obama was going to win the, the candidacy. I remember having lots of discussions with new people in the movement about this. They thought he was going to win because people were in motion, because young people and black people were you know, electing him. And that's what was impulsing him to win. And we had to explain, no. He's winning because the ruling class wants him to win. You know, they're, they're providing the conditions for him. And the fact that there was mass support for him at some level was just secondary and, and because he was black. But the night of the elections, um, I hate to admit this, I don't know if I've ever told this to a lot of comrades, but actually I haven't voted for the presidential elections since 72. And I actually voted for Obama because I, I hated Sarah Palin so much. <laughs> Not that I thought it made a difference, but I just wanted to stand with this black woman who was like in her 90s, who was crying. You know, I wanted to stand with her, and that's why I voted for him. Um, and the night that, of the election, some of us in the party went to Harlem. And it was the most incredible experience. And it was important because you know, here was uh, here. You know, here was an imperialist president. Nothing had changed. We we nothing had changed. We know that the Democratic Party completely plays the role of putting a break in the struggle. You know that their social base is more Latino, more African American, more Unionist. You know, the Republicans' base is more conservative, more white. You know, more rich. So we the Democratic Party is the one that plays a role in putting a break in the struggle. They're the ones we have to contend with in the immigrant rights movement, in the union movement, etc. Nothing had changed about that with the election of Obama. But um, uh, when we were in Harlem that night, the police couldn't keep back people from the streets. And they literally took over the streets. And I couldn't believe how many Latino immigrants and Latino people that I worked with uh, in the movement who didn't live in Harlem also just naturally came to Harlem. And it was just like, you know, there was uh, uh, Louisiana music was being played in the streets. It was incredible. It was like a, a people's victory. It was clearly a people's victory. And as a revolutionary, as a socialist who hates imperialism and understands the role of capitalism, I saw that as a, a people's victory that night, that night alone. And there was one youth in particular um, he was full of rage, this black youth, full of rage, and he had taken off his t-shirt. You could just tell he, was, tell he was a very angry young man, but he was waving his t-shirt, and he was saying, we deserve this, we deserve this. And it was just, you know, a temporary uh, victory for the oppressed in this country. And I think what we have to look at now as revolutionaries is that you know, three years later, fast forward and imagine the demoralization and the frustration among these sectors who voted for Obama and expect a change, you know. And he was voted in on an anti-war mandate. And the first thing he did, well, the second thing he did, the first thing he did was bail out the banks, right? Like day one and day two, he uh, strengthened and uh, reinforced the war. You know, so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why there's a lull in the movement, because people are having to absorb this experience. I'm talking about the masses, I'm not talking about the politicals, right? I'm not talking about the class conscious advanced elements. I'm talking about the masses. And, uh, you know, they have, to, they have to absorb this experience. And one of the reasons why in New York, the same union people who were stopping the May Day March in 2006, who refused to support the May Day March uh, because it was the Red Day, the Communist Day, are now approaching our May 1st coalition to work with us on May Day because so much has happened since 06. And we're not blind about the, these unions who, 
are probably trying to co-opt our movement for the elections in 2012, right? We, you know, we can't allow that. Um, so I, I think that it would be important for us to enter the elections next year, not because we want to win, but because we want to get the attention of the masses to expose, you know, expose the Obama administration. And we have to do it carefully. We can't be strident because, you know, you don't want to, um, He's still black, and you want to be careful, you know, of how you do it, objectively, factually, uh, but carefully. But I think we're going to have to because it's it's a big uh, it's a big phenomenon in this country. So. I would just uh, I'm part of the know that Obama was like nominated that he was going to be surrounded by the CIA. Pentagon, Wall Street, the Treasury, you know, the banker. It wasn't going to be able to move one way or the other without the ruling class. So the Congress, nobody in our party got a big surprise, kind of disillusion. Our party was strong. We knew that this was the destiny of Obama. I mean, because he's the chief executive of U.S. imperialism, and that's a role, and, then, and you have to fulfill that role. And, uh, he's doing it, and so we will prepare. But I think to us, it's pushing, and I agree with her on this, uh, this is a time to run a candidate. There's probably going to be a black candidate you could out of respect to the black community. You, know, you don't want to win a black person against the black president. But capitalism is becoming discretion. It's open for question. And the election period is a period which draws the masses to the election and they open their ears to hear what people are saying. They do it on the campuses, I'll tell you that. All the candidates come to the, to the campuses. And we want to get to the campuses. We want to get out onto the streets, on the soapbox. We want to get on the soundtrack. We want to talk about capitalism as a workers' party. And point out all the things that we do agree. And by the way, I think if our party was big, we could organize farmers. A lot of farmers came to Wisconsin. I don't know how they used it. It was a huge tractor, a tractor a contingent that came to Washington, Madison, Wisconsin. And I've seen farmers on television who sued Monsanto. And this thing that you just raised about the meat, I'm not familiar with that, but I'm sure there's all kinds of ways. I just don't feel really strong enough, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking there is the issue of conservatives and so on. But in general, the electoral period is a period when the masses tend to attention to politics. And so we need to have a voice. And revolutionary socialists need to have a voice. So that it's not just one mile with it, with what up again. It's a test. It's a test for us. It's a test for the movie. <coughs> uh, election, we, 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 elections are attacked. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But I think I agree with the rest of this plan. This moment, the state of the capitalist economy, the level of unemployment and underemployment, the growth of poverty, the number of people who are on food stamps, it's like 47 million or some huge number like that. It's time to intervene politically and to try to get the ear of the advanced workers and, and students who are out there and to bring them towards the socialist perspective and the anti capitalist perspective. You know, some people believe in it and some people don't. But it's a tactical question. This, it's not a principle question. It's a tactic. And we think that, I think we, we think the tactic is, is appropriate. 
in this coming in this coming period. I heard somebody wants to run a socialist came to hit that again. But did I hear that right? Some, some, somebody I heard something. Can you talk? Yeah. Oh. No? Uh. I know the Socialist Party of the USA always trends get trends get Brian Moorhead, whoever it is, on the and I, I know the Socialist Worker Party usually manages to get somebody on the ballot. But they don't really do much, they just show up on the ballot. I mean I don't know if it fits the so I have no idea. You guys have to judge. But it's worth how easy, how easy is it to get a ballot? Yeah, what's the ballot problem? Um, so it it's pretty difficult. They oh, they actually fact. dump a lot of money to get it. Yeah, that's a fact. Yeah. California is 100,000. But anyway, we, we got to get the what we got. We got to get 15,000, which means you got to get 30,000 in New York because they challenge you after you get 30. So you got to get double, you know. And they give you a certain time span of six weeks around all this. And it's, it's tough. But it's worth the effort if you can spend two months of intensified agitation on the people of our campus. It's worth it. And, and, and on the campus. For, for us. Now we have, we discussed it a little bit. We had a national meeting Saturday, this Saturday, a one day plan. And it came up for deliberation. Well, we, we need more deliberation. Right? You know, it's worth thinking about. What are your problems over here politically in this city? Like, how could Marxism help you in your problem, deal with your problems, your issues? Your, your, what, what do you see as your, your problem? Moving forward, or the RSU moving forward. Well, I mean, I feel like there's a general consensus that we don't have many new people attending. So that's something we struggle with, with bringing new people into the movement. New students, I mean, new students, and just residents in general. Well, do you have an analysis of why you think that is? Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with predominantly white, middle class it has a lot to do with, I think, part of it, especially for Utah County, and part of it, the issues of privilege, I'd say. Um, I think that's a part of it, uh, stepping on all of it. Um, I think probably our biggest problem is we just haven't been doing the work on it. I mean, not not to criticize anyone in the RSU or the RSU itself, but this is the first what, eight months or so that we've been engaging in actual campaigns. And so we've been doing campaigns on anti-war, on immigration, on these rights, we've been putting together pamphlets. But what we haven't been doing is we haven't been on campus tabling, we haven't been or at least in a large sense, on campus, like handing out flyers. Um, we've been hitting events, but also we just started the U of U RSU. So a lot of the effort to getting people involved has been up in Salt Lake. Um, is there a lot of students that have been? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Well, at the U of U, I know. Most students. Do you think that's students. an issue that could be used to, to organize? To bring people in. But in a political place, it's not just, oh, you've got a bad meeting. You've got to be more than that. It's got to be exposure. You know, By the way, I, the credit card debt thing is also huge. Mm -hmm. It's a huge thing. And they're starting to, to you not know, do credit cards. I don't want you to say it. I'm just thinking about you know, explaining the financial. Uh, the financiers, how they're winning everything, and how they're making us all into really <laughs> indentured servants. That's what this is. After you get out of college, it's the only loan that you cannot get out of. Right? The student mm -hmm. loan is exempt from bankruptcy proceedings. You cannot do it for your entire life. Every other kind of loan. 
there's some forbidden chapter, 11 chapter, 7, whatever it is, you can declare bankruptcy. They're not a student. You can't do that. And, and, even, and, and there's Wells Fargo over here. Do they do student loans? Who does the student loans? What bank? I think they're not actually done by banks anymore. I think that just recently they were transferred. Federal loan. Yeah, they're federal. They got one over here. They're federal now? Yeah. They were from the banks before. But okay. You can still get a student loan for your bank. But it's uh, through FASPA. Well, I'm just wondering if it's a if, it, if it's a practical and political issue that lends itself to recruiting people to win at the capitalist perspective, but also on the basis of their practical needs and having some kind of program to 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 demand an end to this onerous burden that's being placed upon students to the extent where they can't go to school. Well, they have to drop out, go to work, you know, for 10 years and then go back, you know. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's pretty great. It's like the French Revolution. <laughs> to attack the presence of the young and the and that's not going to be the French Revolution. I mean, that's not But that's an aside. But the tax, it, it's, it's really heavy. Anyway, I'm just. But just going back to your point about you know recruiting, I mean, I travel to the U.S. a lot because of my work, and given the conditions here, you all have a lot of people. And a lot, a small group of people can can do a lot. You know, like you all seem to be very united. You know, very politically clear for the most part. You know, you have a lot of uh, understanding politically, and a small group of people can do a whole lot with that kind of unity and political understanding. So I think uh, I think it's exceptional the work that RSU is doing here, frankly. So I think I'll have a lot of potential to do a lot. The revolution might start here, I don't know. So you should pat yourself on the back for that. Does anybody have any of our pamphlets? Just any pamphlet on anything. Women's Committee, LGBTQ. Yeah, the LGBTQ, I think we should send with these guys because it's really. Good. Would you mind if I? Um, what we actually do, our normal operating procedure, is we find an issue um, that we think is important. And so, with, the, of course, the immortal contributions of J.D. Jensen, uh, we put it together in design. And the way it's actually set up is if you'll notice, um, it, we usually have a really eye-catching front. Yeah, that's pretty good. The, the colors. Is one that designed the bomb? The space. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was that was we, my intransigent yeah. demand on my part. The bomb pen. The pen bomb. We thought it was a bomb. Yeah. Yeah. We get that a lot. We get that. Yeah, a lot of people are like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a Rorschach test. test. <laughs> 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 it actually starts out. Some people, see pens. Out Some people see pens. Some people see So you'll notice it starts with a pair of pens to the right. But then as you go further in the pamphlet, it actually gets into more propaganda in the Leninist sense. You'll notice there's this is healthcare and women's rights, but then it's capitalism as women's oppressor, and then also a critique of liberal feminism. And then, um, and then on the back, we have a, a call to action. And most of our pamphlets are like that, like our anti-war pamphlet covers how much money is going in, how many people have died, but then it goes into a wider critique of imperialism. And this is true of all of our pamphlets, so that you can just hand them to someone, there's the straight facts right up front. Um, going sort of off what you're saying, this immediate agitation demand, and then there's a wider examination of like the root causes later, which hopefully will get people in. And I mean, I'm guessing everyone in this room um, with the exception of Chris, myself, and Jacob, has been in some way recruited to RSU. So it's a moderately effective process. By the way, just for your information, we're struggling to grow too, <laughs> as a party. Isn't it reactionary period? You know, brainwashing goes pretty far and pretty deep. 
And, it's, and uh, so I think Therese is right. It, you got a really a nice group. <laughs> don't, don't sit yourself. Sure, but we got to struggle to do it. my question about that. And the question is whether, you know, these, they serve one purpose, but then you need to decide, is there a campaign that we're going to do? Is there some struggle? Over this debt, or well, whatever it is, or I don't know why they. Uh, what about the workers on the campus? Uh, are they unions? Are they? Are they, uh, are they? Do they have to the There's. I know there's a few teachers unions. We've been talking about this, and we've been talking about unionizing the food workers um, and, and the janitorial staff. That's moving slowly. Recently, there's been changes in policies towards the adjunct professors. Um, okay. And, and and a lot of the adjunct professors, oh, yeah, uh, don't are, are reacting very poorly to it. Essentially, their contracts are nullified and they have to reapply like every year, right? Um, and so that that's an opportunity. I know some people have been uh, looking to that, but are, are the uh, are there any movement among the workers to any section of the workers to be interested in? Or is this something that's coming completely from the outside? Um, except for one food service guy who actually got fired, um, it would be a completely outside movement. Um, however, one good break that we have, or just backing up a little, usually what we do with our campaigns or our campaign strategies, um, and I don't mean that obviously politically, but our, or politically in the like election sense. Um, is we have a committee that sort of guides actions and sort of plans stuff and works with other groups related. Like, as you heard from Kristen, right, we're going to attend um, stuff, you know, that deals with women's rights. Uh, you heard from Emily, we're going to attend Pride, we're going to work there, you know, handing out. Or we have an LGBTQ revolutionary pamphlet, um, you know, that calls for revolutionary equal rights rather than just tolerance. And so what happens is we usually have a committee that has either one person leading it or like a bunch of people leading it. And they set up a campaign struggle, ask for help, flyering, talking to people, contacting uh, you know, other groups to get involved. Uh, I'm head of the union committee. And I, as someone who has survived a failed union drive, it's really hard to bring that outside. Um, but one thing that concretely we can work on and I'll be able to do so better once I you know, start working with IOTC, is our area is not, or our the, uh, event center is not a union shop, which means there's sometimes union shows and sometimes not union shows. And so rather than bringing this from the outside, because I've talked to janitorial staff, I've talked to, has anyone else here talked to janitorial staff or um, food staff about unionizing? Um, I mean, they haven't, the janitorial staff hasn't had a raise in three years, and I literally passed out union. We have a union committee pamphlet that talks about unions and why you need them. And literally, like, three of them were like, I don't like unions. And so that would be a really difficult struggle. So what we've been trying to do, especially shifting gears in this last eight months, and anyone feel free to jump in, is connect with organic struggles and help bring them into a more revolutionary vein and perspective. Um, but then also as a side note, we're, our very next meeting is not going to have a topic, but is rather going to be a planning meeting for the entire semester. So we can start gauging out those campaigns so they correspond to uh, student schedules and, you know, we can actually have a plan of action for next year so that they always get carried through. And they don't get carried through slowly, but get carried through a measured pace. Yeah, and I, I might add, it's not one of these situations where we can uh, get like an overwhelmingly broad support for things like, say, for instance, reducing down tuition. Like, we uh, had a campaign where we went around and tried to get signatures for people to actually lower tuitions. You'd actually be surprised by what some of the people would say. It's like, oh, no, I don't want the state subsidizing my tuition. Things like that. I mean, like, what? yeah, yeah, I mean, like. I've heard this before. I mean, everybody who's uh, who's gone around the clipboard. Common response. Right, but yeah. like this is the thing: is like, where else would you hear that? I mean, there are a few other places where you'd hear. This is Utah. This is like the reddest of the red states. So we can't come out and be like, 
listen, we just need, you know, state to come in and subsidize your education. Like, that's not a valid message. What we have to do as, uh, or what I see our campaigns as doing, is exposing the systemic nature of capitalism. Uh, rather than just saying, oh, well, these corporations are bad and you just need to fight against this one, you know. Because, like, you know, even people on the right are all like, oh, yeah, we need to get rid of the corporations. And then you're like, that one. And they're like, no, 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 that one's mine. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for us to be such a direct approach is, is like something basically just immediately gets dismissed out of hands. But we do have other struggles that I think do connect with people in a very... Uh, guttural way, uh, a very gut level, like our UTA, our ride UTA strategy. What? Our ride UTA? UTA is the transportation. Oh, yeah. They've raised the student, the oh, student pass 400%. This is true. Yeah, I mean, so like, I mean, that's being run through student committee, uh, student council, and we're actually working with other people in terms of getting that active. It's died a little bit during the summer semester, but... Yeah, you gotta wait till the fall right. to really get it going. But, I mean, like, that allows us to actually talk and do real effective work rather than just going in front of... <laughs> instead of just, uh, you know, saying, like, oh, no, you need to reduce the tuition costs and, you know, let's socialize all the... The education. I mean, ultimately, that's our message. But what we need to do is reveal the systemic natures of capitalism as being the problems. Because people already have theories as to why things there are, and a lot of them are already, you know, 30, 50, 60 percent right. What would it take to stop the to, to, to stop the, the cuts in the bus fees? What would it take? When is it going to be adjudicated? Who, who decides? Is it is there a transportation authority here? Yeah, the way that it is, it's kind of like a semi-privatized. Uh -huh. It's kind of like in how the post office is kind of private, but also like heavily, very federally subsidized slash looked over. That's the, kind of the way that our UTA is, is done. It's a private bus company it's like a contract. uh, contracted by the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's like, it's, uh, it's heavily subsidized, but the thing is there's a bunch of scandals around it. Like it's a very clandestine organization that runs it. And so, you know, we have lots of potential ends. It's just a matter of, you know, hitting it the right moment. Like, for instance, at the very beginning of the school semester, when people are standing in line to buy their bus pass, <laughs> that's a good time to start, you know, things like this. What's involved in, I mean, what kind of inconvenience is involved in running the bus routes, specifically to students? Well, it's not so much. It's not students only. It, this it's, is everybody. There is general problems related to our bus system, especially along economic lines, like for instance, the quote unquote other side of the tracks in Salt Lake has severely cut services. Uh, but in relationship to students, it's just the raise in price. I mean. You're gonna raise the price? Oh Why yeah. Are they the bus service? No, they're not cutting the bus service. Right, it used to be free. Right, it used to be free. Uh, it's what? Four hundred and six hundred. It's going from twenty dollars to one hundred and twenty dollars. Yeah. That's six hundred percent. For that, they should burn down the transportation. You're burning down a lot of things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a five hundred percent increase or something. No, yeah. I mean, it's affecting all workers, yeah. especially people that have disabilities. They cut down a lot of the stops that they stop at. Yeah. And so a lot of the people like in wheelchairs have to go through unsafe areas. So you can mobilize the disabled community. Well, there is a, a group of uh, disabled community members that have a group of so here. Called DRAC, disabled. But his uncle is really involved with that. Yeah. Well, a few of my relatives are really involved in it. Well, what do they have to do? They have to have hearings about this? So how does it get go from some proposal to being like an act? Oh uh, geez, I Greg, I think I Yeah, think I think Greg might be able to speak a little bit better on that. Well, for us, uh, or maybe I'm not if anyone disagrees, feel free to jump in. For the RSU we run into the same problem that Workers World Party had with the farmers in Monsanto. Like, I mean obviously this is Utah. Utah has about what, two to three million people tops. 
So when you get two rooms like this, this full, that's not too bad of a number. But also when you're talking around, uh, about taking on the Utah Transit Authority, you need a lot more people. Um, there were all sorts of hearings. There were all sorts of um, uh, like discussions that nobody went to. And unfortunately, um, the Revolutionary Students Union is, has only been around a while. Uh, we've been through several restructurings since we formed. And people, a lot of people actually, know to come to us when they have problems. But usually they come to us after the problem has already happened. So this would be sort of like the UTA bus strike uh, or bus fight back. There were a lot of processes along the way that were just you know, buried through bureaucracy. Like they're not exactly hidden. They're just not made particularly public. And so we came in at the end of the day after it was basically told to us initially that they were going to cut all of our bus passes entirely. And it was going to go up to $600. Then we were getting the good deal. So from 20 to 600. Then we got the good deal of 120, which is still not clear that they, they're still in negotiation with the schools, the UTA is. So that's not set in stone. But now it's all in the court of UTA, excuse me, UTA and the schools themselves, which again is why we're also having this planning meeting, is because if we have a planning meeting, we can set it up so we're always attending all the school meetings we need, we can attend all of the meetings we need, and that we can plan our and advertise for our events to bring people in. Like Chris had a great idea. Uh, we have Club Rush where we're going to be out as a club, you know, trying to get people to join. But then we're actually going to put together a conference afterwards, tentatively. Um, but it's basically a week of capitalist awareness. And so we'll be inviting speakers from all over the state. Hopefully we'll get enough money to invite other people in, a wide range of issues. And those sorts of events, if we haven't planned out long enough, will let us advertise properly for them. And hopefully even get teachers to give credit for like going to stuff. So that when next year rolls around, we actually do have the mass numbers to mobilize people on these issues. But at least for right now, a lot of us are doing a lot of different struggles. And so it's very difficult for us to keep up on everything all the time. Just because I'm sure you guys run into this all the time. You hear about something, you're like, hey, it would be great to run a campaign there. Who do we have who can do it? Everybody's busy, or every or nobody has the, the time or the money to do so. But um, uh, but you know it's it's that sort of thing that we're running into. Hi guys, sorry I'm gonna go. I mean, I don't want to suggest for you to change your orientation. I was just thinking, since you said, how do we, how do we grow? I mean, if you could really become instrumental in a practical struggle, you know, it, it, you know, the first thing you to track every single week process involved in this. I mean, if you can really do know everything about it, who's got what authority, what is this between the schools and the transit system? What is that? What is it? Well, basically what it is, is the schools get, give them a lump sum out of student fees, and then they're allowed to, students are then allowed to have a, a discounted bus pass. So the negotiation was how much money was going to be required uh, for us to get bus passes. So the school subsidizes to a certain amount, and then students have to pay the difference. So for the United, or, uh, sorry, for UTA, um, they're negotiating with the schools what lump sum the schools have to take out of student fees, and the schools are trying to get a lower amount of fees taken out or a lower student price. And so that's sort of the negotiations that's going on. Because every school in Utah rejected UTA's proposal. Yeah. And it was across the board to every school in Utah um, because they were trying to raise rates. 
I have a question sort of along the lines of what Fred was saying. Um, the, our party often has assessed that in order, because our goal is to organize and try to organize as much opposition to whatever U.S. policy or practice we uh, target at the time, we often create, uh, you know, broad funds. Like, for example, the party created the International Action Center in the early 90s to organize against the war. Um, and it has helped to bring in people who are not ready or willing or want to join a party or even be associated with a party. And we've done that because we want to have alliances that open up struggles, right? And we often have, we often calculate that it's important to do that. Like, to this day, the, the biggest action that has been organized for Cuba in support of the Cuban Revolution is something that the party organized. And it was, it was so important that uh, Fidel actually sent a message to this event that we organized. And we organized it under the name of Peace for Cuba. This was in the early 90s, you know, to bring in people who may not necessarily support the revolution, but who were against the blockade. So that's why we said peace versus U.S. imperialism out of Cuba. You know, that tactic might not be uh, effective or appropriate right now, but in the early 90s, it was. So would the RSU, would it be appropriate to consider, like, like your alliance with the USJ? Is that what it's called, USJ? You know, that's a way to bring in people who don't want to be associated with a, uh, something like that's called RSU, but who want to engage in a struggle. The, like, do y'all assess if that's something to do or appropriate? Or? Somebody else answer the question. Well, I was going to say, yeah, I think that's a main <laughs> the part of it. The women. <laughs> we, we try to speak up around here. So, um, I'm just teasing. So, um, I definitely think that's an important thing, and I, I think in especially there's a few things in relationships with women particularly, a few things that are starting to sprout, so I've been you know, trying to make those connections with people there as well, like who, you know, people that might not, like you're saying, want to join a revolutionary movement but are upset about attacks on Planned Parenthood that are, you know, um, even like the slut walking, I have lots of critiques of it. It's still people that are exciting, and moving forward, um, and so trying to find that in you know, those small ways of looking for that. So it's like kind of keeping your eyes and ears to the ground, I think, as well, all the time, and seeing what is pissing people off, and how you can just start working with them and getting them, you know, excited without, without necessarily like just dumping that revolution down their throat, because then you get. Well, I didn't want to start the whole thing. I think another thing, too, that might be good um, is like joining, I don't know, if, like joining other movements that are already happening. Like, I know there's a group called the Wasatch Coalition for Peace, and um, it, it was actually kind of started by a socialist but kind of a weird relationship with that, but um, like helping them upstart again. I, I don't know, organizations that already exist with the struggle, I think it would be good for us to unite and maybe send people like delegates or people that are interested in, in, in working in that. So not even just starting something up, but getting involved with different groups that are already doing good work. I think you know your name might might have a certain impact for people, but you know it's so clear that you guys know how to work with all layers. It's like clear that you don't you know you don't have a dogmatic approach or an alt left approach. So that even sooner or later the RSU name will be known for an honest, genuine fighting coalition. You know, even if it does have revolution in its name in Utah, right? So it's just. It's also not just about your name. I don't want to imply that you should, you should change your name because it's really how you're applying, you know, in practice or struggle. That's also incredibly impressive. Well, and I mean, one of the things we actually do do is, you know, with the UCA Fight Back, that's what it's called. It's called the UCA Fight Back. That's the organization that organizes and it carries out the um, struggle for that. So,
So again, it's not necessarily that the, the RSU obviously people get turned off by the word revolution. This is actually something we run into a lot with uh, United for Social Justice was there were a lot of people trying to smear it as a communist organization because there were active people who were communists or anarchists within it. Um, which is actually, I mean, it'll be something I actually want to ask you a question about, but to hold that for a second. But the point being is we do carry out mass work and we do it through mass organizations rather than just revolutionary. Mm -hmm. We consider this to be more like, okay, well, if you want to learn more about revolution per se and come to these meetings. But if you just want to you know, make sure you're not getting um, screwed over on your bus passes, well, then do you take five back, pass out flyers, et cetera, et cetera. But then circling back to what I was going to ask you. Was, you, you mentioned something during your brief comments. Of, yeah, a lot of people from um, who are immigrating here come from a class conscious background. And, well, I mean, my experience of dealing with um, USJ and Salt Lake is a lot of people, or at least maybe they're just being led astray, which is also a good possibility, are very hesitant about getting involved with socialism and communism. Um, and especially since the fact that I think that they are undocumented, and it's that type of thing that gets looked out for and added up, and then all of a sudden they're finding their families being deported. So I, could, I was wondering how you would maybe, this could be your side of your experience. Well, the immigrant rights movement is very complex. It's not homogeneous. You know, it's, it's both a worker struggle that has uh, elements of the fight against racism because it's mainly people of color, but it's also a civil rights struggle. You know, so that, that means that, you know, it has moderate forces within it, right? Um, I mean, I think, I think that the attitude of immigrants is deep. And on the surface, it may be appear that they don't want to be close to electoralization. But I think that's just on the surface for most. And that the overriding concern is their status, and so that they have to be careful. Um, I mean, our coalition has the party decided in New York City that we would play a lot, a big role in the May First Coalition. And in 06, we were really regulated in our own form because the party played a big role. But we weren't the only organization, right? Immigrant rights organizations, we had labor activists, it was very multinational, and so forth and so on. And through the years, since 06, the red baiting that we occurred uh, and faced at the time has really been one way based on our work. You know, we were very solid, we provided safe space for immigrants, we were clear on legalization, you know, that there was no compromise on that question. And so immigrants that were red baiting us in 06 are actually now much closer to the coalition based on our work. So, you know, I think, um, I think that it's a sleeping giant still to be awakened, that it woke up in 06 in a certain way, but, you know, is it ready to, you know, come out? Many are, but there's Victor Toro, for example, in New York, is a complete communist revolutionary leader, about to be deported, struggling for political asylum, and isn't quiet at all about his left leanings. But he's rare because of the repression in the situation. But, you know, I don't think he's an isolated incident either. So, as a Latino uh, person, as an immigrant too, I, I think the biggest problem with the Latino community, especially here in Utah, is not like a, a, they're not willing to work with the socialists or communists or revolutionary groups, you know? I think basically they're not willing to work with anyone, you know? They're really apathetic about the whole thing, you know? Um, Majority, you know, they're like, uh, they don't want to do anything. They want to keep like a low profile and get out of travel, you know, and waiting for something to happen, basically, you know. And I think the best way to await them is like, try to find like the ways to reach these people, you know, and make them understand, like, as long as like they don't get active, they don't change, you know, basically. But that's the biggest stats, I guess. Well, there's a terrible, there's a terrible wave of repression happening. Yeah. You can't blame people for not.